Welcome to this, se this session of the Jacksonville Onzo Board Development Training and Conference. I'm Carmela George with Community Affairs for the City of Jacksonville. We're proud to be part of this partnership that has created this conference. Again, we'd like to thank Coastal Carolina, the United Way, Keno, um, and the community, North Carolina Community Foundation for the partnership that makes this um, event possible. Right now, we're going to talk about organizing capital campaigns. I know there are at least three capital com campaigns that are underway in our community right now, and that there are more capital campaigns that are likely to be launched shortly. It seems easy from the outside, daunting from the inside, and scary once they are underway. A key, a key question is whether your organization is ready for a capital campaign. Paul Johnson is a senior consultant with Alexander Haas, one of the premier fund development firms in the country. Paul is a seasoned arts management and fundraising professional and has over 20 years of experience working at institutions both large and small in a variety of communities. We are tremendously appreciative of the time and knowledge he will share with us today. He is overqualified to help us evaluate whether your organization is ready for a capital campaign. Here now, Mr. Paul Johnson. <laughs> I'm actually sort of like a bad penny more than being overqualified. Um, so there we go. It works. Great. Are you ready for a capital campaign? Um, so today I want to sort of take you through um, a little bit of the history of <clears throat> sort of what a capital campaign is these days, what it was, what it is, and sort of what you need to do internally and externally to get get your institution ready for a capital campaign. <clears throat> Traditionally, um, and this is, you know, in the middle of the 20th century, I would say, a capital campaign um, was what we now call the annual fund. Um, it was a very discreet amount of time um, where funds were solicited to support um, the ongoing operations of an institution. Um, and in the early days of capital campaigns, they were called community chests um, or united ways, um, something like, you know, something along those lines. But since the 70s and 80s, the concept of a capital campaign has begun to change. Um, annual funds were put into place, <clears throat> and capital campaigns were, I'm trying to get this to work, there you go. Capital campaigns were um, seen as discrete projects outside of your sort of ongoing operations. And they were, do we need money for um, a new hospital wing? We need money for a new church. We need money for this very discrete project. And so we would go out and we would raise $50 million for um, a new building, or we would raise $10 million for a new um, playground, or something like that. <clears throat> as Capital campaigns have evolved. There is now the concept, and this is something that we use all the time, of a comprehensive campaign. And that comprehensive campaign is a fundraising effort that in can include all types of giving, cash, pledges, equipment, ongoing support, planned gifts, kitchen sinks, whatever you want, we can throw that into the capital campaign. The reason we do this is because <clears throat> Capital campaigns are no longer really about, um, let's just build this building. Campaigns are about transforming institutions. Campaigns are about taking institutions from one level to another level. Um, and in doing so, it's sort of the, the concept of when the tide rises, all boats rise. Um, the result of these big comprehensive campaigns that have, have been happening um, means that instead of a campaign that lasts one year or two years, campaigns are now lasting five years, six years, 10 years, or in the cases of um, some institutions, campaigns last forever. They, there are literally institutions that are in constant campaign mode, constant. Um, another thing that has happened um, in the last 25 years is the professionalism of the development staff. Um, people like me who become uh, fundraising professionals within institutions. Um, it was for a very long time that all of the fundraising was done on a volunteer level. Um, it was done by board members. It was done peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, it was 
done um, without any staff involvement whatsoever. Um, those days have very much changed, and now there are institutions where there is a blend of um, staff supporting trustee, uh, supporting volunteers and trustees, um, and there are institutions where um, volunteers and trustees are not engaged whatsoever in a campaign, and it's all staff driven. And all of the soliciting is done by the chief executive and the chief development officer and, um, and the development office. Um, and that is, a, that is a fairly significant change. Um, so what is, this, what, it, what is required of a successful capital campaign? We see it as there being three elements. The first is the mission or the case. <clears throat> What will my gift enable the blank museum, blank hospital, blank, you know, fill in the blank to do, and why is it important? And that is not the donor asking the question, that is us asking the question to the donor. We need to tell you why what we're doing is important, why what we're doing in the world makes a difference, why we matter. So what is the case? The second is leadership. Who's going to tell your story? Do you have the right people telling your story? Do you have the right director in place? Do you have the right chairman of the board in place? Do you have the right campaign uh, chairman in place? Do you have the right volunteers in place? Are they connected in the right places? Are they connected to the institution in the right way? So who's going to tell the story? Who's going to make the ask? And who's going to motivate others to give? That leadership piece is very important. And the third is, and this seems sort of like a you know V8 moment, like duh. Um, are there actually the resources there to do what you want to do? Um, is there the money there? Um, how are we going to get, how are we going to do what we do? Will there be, where will the leadership gifts come from? Who will be our key supporters? Um, it is not advised, we do not advise people to launch capital campaigns without knowing who their top 10 donors are and without knowing very clearly who their top 10 donors are. Um, because without having that knowledge, um, you start up behind the eight ball from the get-go. So um, let me talk a little bit about um, campaign preparation. Proper preparation for a campaign uh, starts with the Board of Trustees. Um, it is the most important part of a successful fundraising drive. Many organizations should start years in advance of a major effort by properly building a Board of Trustees who can provide leadership and major gifts to the campaign. All of the goals for the campaign should be properly aligned within the mission of the organization and should flow from a strategic planning process so that there's a complete consensus on comp campaign objectives. The involvement of potential donors in the strategic planning process cannot be minimized. Let me say that again. The involvement of potential donors in the strategic planning process cannot be minimized. You have to give donors a place at the table. You have to have them have a voice in the institution. Um, involvement in the future of the organization is the, first st st is the first step one takes to invest in the future. The second is that you have to have a strategic plan. People need to know what you're going, uh, where you're going and how, and how you're going to get there. Um, as I said in my first session um, an hour or so ago, um, hope is not a strategic plan. Um, we hope to do this. We hope to build this building. We hope to build this endowment. Hope is not a strategic plan. A strategic plan is a strategic plan. A strategic plan involves the entire institution from the trustees down to, um, I've, I've had strategic planning committees where we've had um, guards and custodians and educators and curators and um, senior staff people all sitting on the same committee all talking about what the strategic plan can be. You would be shocked at how much information the janitors and the guards in a, muse in a museum have about that institution. So much more information than we have sitting up on the top floor of the administrative building. Um, the, sec the, the third part of campaign preparation is a strategic assessment. Um, and I'll talk in a minute about the role of campaign council in all of this. but. Um, a strategic assessment is um, usually means retaining counsel, a uh, consultant like myself or our firm, to work with the organization to conduct an assessment of the organization's ability to mount a successful um, 
successfully sustain a major fundraising drive. An internal assessment is generally recommended early in the preparation of a campaign. This study reviews the current workings of the development operation and makes specific recommendations for future activities that will enable a successful campaign. The internal audit review of all systems, personnel, policies, and volunteer and leadership activities, and then makes specific sets of recommendations on how to tweak things internally to make sure they work properly. So we come in um, as a third party. We look at every system that's working. We look at your database. We look at um, do you have the right staffing in place? Is the, are the right resources being allocated to, to make this successful internally before you go, before you go externally? The second part of that strategic assessment is um, what is generally referred to as a feasibility study. So that feasibility study is where, where a consultant, and it doesn't have to be me, but if you hire a consultant, you should hire me, so that's my pitch right here, um, is that we take your case, um, and we take your case to your top 25 or 30 donors, and we say, here is what your XYZ institution wants to do. This is the direction they want to take. Tell us what you think of that. Give us your feedback on that. Tell us what you love about it. Tell us what you hate about it. Tell us um, if things changed, would you consider a larger gift? If things stayed the same? If the leadership changed? So we get all of this information in this feasibility study. Then we are, as consultants, able to come back to the institution and say, you know what? The children's wing of the hospital is testing really well. And we know where that gift is going to come from, and, and that's testing really well. What's not testing well is the recreation center. That's not testing well at all. And I think we need to think about sort of tweaking your case so we sort of dial down the recreation center and really dial, dial up the children's wing. It gives you, as an institution, information that you won't, wouldn't normally have. Um, and it's not, it's not at all a subversive activity. It is an open and honest discussion that they can have with us that, that um, oftentimes they don't feel that they can have with the institution because either the relationship is too close or they don't want to hurt people's feelings or they don't want to speak up. Or, and, and when we can amalgamate um, comments like that, it really comes back with a much stronger case for support. Um, let me talk for a second about the selection of counsel. Um, the selection of counsel is much like hiring a member of your staff. Um, the institution is entering into a relationship with someone who's going to engage with your top stakeholders. So you're not hiring a vendor. You're hiring someone that you need to trust, and you're hiring someone who, needs, who can, you can trust to steward the message of your institution. Um, what, is, what are some of the common mistakes in institutions make in hiring counsel are that they fall in love with the salesperson from the firm. You can't fall in love with the person. Um, you still have this um, contractual relationship with them. Not understanding that the counsel is not a paid fundraiser. The counsel is not going to go out and ask for the money. The counsel is going to help you strategize as to how to ask for the money, but the counsel is not the person who is the fundraiser. We're the person who is helping you get out the door to do the fundraising. Um, focusing on the firm that has the lowest price, it's a big mistake. Um, not involving volunteers in the selection of the council, that's key, is that the um, interview should include trustees and volunteers. Um, not believing in the value of a well done study. Um, and developing an exhaustive request for proposal, which is greatly discouraged by many firms from responding for calls to proposal. We receive RFPs that are so long that we just look at them and throw them out the window. It's like, we don't want the business. It's too hard for us to get that business to write this, to write this RFP. So the last piece in terms of getting an internal, internally ready for a campaign is campaign coordination. And what that is is um, dedicating an identifier, ad identifying staff within the institution who are going to be responsible for the campaign. The campaign will become central to the institution's day-to-day -day activities. Somebody has to be the traffic cop internally. Somebody has to be keeping track of which prospects are being talked to when, um, who is talking to them, um, 
you know, about 30 to 40 percent of the time of the executive director will probably be spent on the campaign. About 50 percent of the time the development director will be spent on the campaign. But somebody has to be hired and those resources have to be dedicated internally to um, managing the campaign. Um, uh, going on. The campaign plan. So once you have all of that internal piece in place, um, the strong case st statement for support, committed and capable volunteers, a campaign strategy that works, um, a dedicated campaign staff, a campaign budget that needs to be developed and funded, and I can talk about campaign budgets in a second, printed materials with a case statement, gift opportunities, brochure, letterhead, pledge cards, et cetera, um, um, we then need to put into place the campaign plan. So how are we going to get from having zero dollars to having a hundred million dollars or whatever, or ten million dollars or whatever goal that we're going to have? Um, how the organization goes about beginning the campaign in order to gain essential early, in order to gain essential early momentum. It's a fact that most campaigns that begin well tend to go well and be successful. The reverse is also true. Those efforts that sputter, have false starts, and abandon basic capital campaign principles tend to never get um, on the proper track for success. Therefore, the first part of writing the plan is to develop a strategy that will effect, in effect guarantee the initial part of the fundraiser will be successful and the campaign will de develop an image as a winner amongst um, the few who can actually make it so. Um, this is why the plan is so important. It's very important that as you get out the gate that you know who you're talking to and who you're talking to, you're going to have success in that conversation. Because if you as an institution are setting up a solicitation with one of your top 10 donors and it hasn't been strategized and thought about and um, very carefully articulated and you come back with a no from that solicitation, it's going to take the wind out of everybody's sails and suddenly your campaign's going to sputter. So you need that sort of momentum right at the beginning to, um, to get the campaign off the ground in the right way. Um, campaign organization. Um, this is essentially uh, the notion that there needs to be organized within institutions dedicated campaign um, committees and volunteers who are going to be responsible um, and accountable for the solicitation of gifts. So this often includes a campaign chair who is not the chair of the board, but somebody who is um, on the board who um, takes ownership of the success of the campaign. Um, that chair will have working with him or her a steering committee of people who have prospects assigned to them, who, who have uh, the responsibility also for um, soliciting gifts and then supporting and supporting that are perhaps smaller committees. One might be a um, person who's responsible for soliciting a board, somebody the board, somebody responsible for soliciting lead gifts, someone for major gifts. Um, you know, so there's there's a structure that happens around the campaign that is different from your board of trustees. It is not a governance issue, but it is really a fundraising issue, and it is a fundraising. Um, function. So this is another piece of the campaign that's very important is, is you're asking volunteers and trustees who are already giving so much of their time to give more of their time because this is an incremental effort above and beyond um, what they're already doing for your institution. Sequential fundraising. <clears throat> this sort of makes sense when you think about it, but how many times have you sat in a meeting where somebody who suddenly becomes a math genius and says, you know what, if we found a thousand people to give a thousand dollars, we'd reach our goal. Really? Yeah, that'd be great. Who are those thousand people and they're going to give a thousand dollars? The idea of sequential fundraising is that you need to start with your lead gifts. You need to go out the door with your lead gifts. You cannot start with your smaller gifts. You cannot start at the bottom of the pyramid. You actually have to stop at the, start at the top of the pyramid. You have to get an understanding of where 
where that lead gift is coming from and, and have everything follow behind it. Um, to do it the other way, first of all, would be, would take so long um, and secondly, be so cost ineffective and time ineffective that it would be demoralizing for the institution. So securing those lead gifts at the beginning um, is really crucial. The plan um, of the campaign is also used as an educational tool. The other function of the capital campaign plan is to educate those involved with its um, execution and to anticipate key issues that will inevitably occur later in the campaign. The educational part of the plan is presentation should be emphasized the, con the concept of sequential fundraising and the concept of the, the solicitation of smaller gifts rarely, if ever, is key to the success of a capital campaign. <clears throat> the plan is also an anticipatory, anticipatory tool and guide. Um, the plan can be used as a great PR, um, a great PR uh, engine for the institution. Um, named gift opportunities. It's very important within the plan that you be able to identify what those named gift opportunities are. So when you are out talking to donors about what they might, how they might participate, that they can actually visualize. Um, where they're going to fit into the campaign, where their name is going to fit into the campaign. If you're building a building, have a floor plan, and that floor plan, you know, it is sometimes flexible, it is sometimes um, changeable, but you know, for someone to be able to see, oh look, my name can be on that wall, my name can be on that room, makes a giant difference for people in terms of um, persuading them to participate in your campaign. <clears throat> Um, even though there are institutions that uh, are in constant campaign mode, um, I am a firm believer that campaigns need to have a beginning, middle, and an end. Um, if you are in constant campaign mode or if you've decided that your campaign is going to be 10 years long, um, people get tired and people get bored. And, you know, so it's, I think it's really important to say, okay, we're going to raise $10 million, and our goal in, is to raise this $10 million over three to five years, five years maximum. Um, after five years, volunteers get bored, volunteers move on, they become invested in other organizations. Um, I think that unless you can get this done in sort of, not short order necessarily, but there needs to be a time frame and there needs to be um, some benchmarks that people can um, adhere to, so otherwise it just goes on and on and on, and, pe and people frankly lose interest. Um, <clears throat> the range of gifts table, and this is, I apologize because this is going to be very hard to read on this screen, um, is really, I think, one of the most important, whoops, oh, the range of gifts table is after, I'm sorry, my uh, slides are screwed up. Why you write a plan? Well, let's get to the range of gifts table in a second. Going back, talking about a plan. Why you write a plan? It's self-discipline. Um, the staff, the CEO, have understanding and buy-in to the plan. It encourages volunteer involvement. Um, it's about strategy development. It points out weaknesses and challenges within the institution. Um, it points out who does what, when, where, why, and how. All right, so let's talk about the range of gifts table. And like I said, this is going to be a little hard to read. So we typically put together a range of gifts table. So say you have, what is this campaign? This campaign is, hold on. Right, this campaign is $30 million, okay? so. What we essentially say at $30 million is that your top gift, your lead gift at $30 million needs to be 20% or more of your goal. So at $30 million, we're going to be looking for a $6 million lead gift. And we're also then going to be looking for one $4 million lead gift, one $4 million gift, two $2 million gifts, five $1 million gifts, eight $500,000 gifts, 
12 $250,000 gifts, $1,500,000 gifts, $20,000, $50,000 gifts, and $25,000, $25,000 gifts, and many, many gifts under $25,000. That many gifts under $25,000 is, is your paver campaign. So, you know, you finish your building and you want to put, you know, a beautiful sort of patio around the building and everybody gets to name a brick. That's your paver campaign. Or you um, want to put names on, on um, you know, bricks on a wall, something like that. So imagine this range of gifts table if your lead gift was 10% of $30 million. So you, what, what that means is your, your lead gift is $3 million. And that $3 million person has decided they want to name your building. You can't solicit anybody. You've made the floor the ceiling at $3 million. You can't go to somebody for $6 million and say, oh, but, you know, Joe named the building for $3 million, but for $6 million, we'll name this room after you or something like that. But imagine, too, when you work down this pyramid, how many gifts you have to get at the bottom to make your goal. I mean, it just becomes this, and it becomes actually a matter of sort of diminishing returns because there just aren't that many prospects. In any organization, there just aren't that many prospects. So this actually, for us, is one of the most important documents that we hand out to volunteers, to board members, to staff members, to CEOs. Um, this is the guide that they need to follow. If, for example, someone comes in and gives $10 million instead of $6 million, fantastic. You know, that sort of changes the whole pyramid entirely. But unless you can strive for that 20% of that top gift, um, your campaign is, I'm not going to say your campaign is not going to be successful. Your campaign is going to take a really long time to get through um, because you're going to have to sort of slog in that, in that sort of lower gift um, area for a very, very long time. So. In, in essence, what we're saying is keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on the very big prize. Everything will follow it after that, but keep your eye on the prize. <clears throat> I talked a little bit about the role of campaign council in terms of providing internal assessment, um, are helping you articulate your case. Um, it's often really uh, advisable that council come in and look at your institution. Sometimes everybody in the institution, trustees, CEOs, development directors, whatnot, are so close to the institution, and they're so, um, they're so close to all the problems of the institution that they're not sort of seeing the glory of the institution. And so oftentimes a third party council could come in and, and not care about sort of that day-to-day -day mishigas that goes on, that was a New York word, um, but sort of really um, help elevate that institution. Because case statements need to be lofty documents. They need to be really, um, inspirational and lofty and um, aspirational documents. They're not, like I said earlier, they're not about turning on the lights. They're about the big vision of the institution. And we can, um, you know, council often can, can help you sort of elevate that conversation. Um, that external assessment we talked about, the feasibility study, and then ongoing campaign council, helping you, helping you to develop strategies around um, your solicitations and your um, contributions. So <clears throat> this is my, I have two favorite charts in the whole world and I threw them in this um, presentation uh, for a reason. This is what I call the major gifts development cycle. It's the life cycle of a donor. Um, and it starts on the upper right hand corner with identification. We've identified, you know, that Joe Smith who lives down the street He's got a lot of money. Wait, we think he has a lot of money, or he seems to have a lot of money. But you know, he comes to receptions from time to time. He gives us maybe a membership. He, um, you know, he seems to be somewhat engaged, but not really. But he drives a Bentley, and you know, I mean, he seems to have a lot of money. So the next step in that is qualification, and how do we qualify qualify him? Qualification is done in many ways. One is um, a lot of development offices these days are engaged in very sophisticated prospect research. And there's a lot of information on donors that we can find out thanks to the Freedom of Information Act and, and other very legal and very above board ways that we can actually find out information about this donor. Um, so we qualify them and we say, hey, and it's also as easy as saying, hey, Joe down the street is just gave a, you know, a million dollars to the hospital, so we know he's got the money, 
So he's, he, we, know, we know he has the capacity, but does he have the inclination? The next step is cultivation. Cultivation can last for a very, very, very long time, or it can be very short. But it's, you know, who is he having lunch with? What trustees is he engaging with? What events is he coming to? What mailings does he get? What information does he get from the institution? Um, a cultivation gift can, or a cultivation can also include small gifts. Hey, Joe, do you mind, you know, we need $10,000 for this little project over here, or we need, you know, $5,000 for this little project over here, or, um, you know, it can include that kind of thing. Cultivation, then we go into solicitation, and this is solicitation of the major gift. Then you close that gift, and then, very importantly, you steward that gift. You take care of that donor. You don't ever stop saying thank you. You don't spell his name wrong on the wall. You don't leave his name off the donor list. You do not forget to recognize him at parties. You do, you, it's the most important thing in the world. Because guess what? The circle starts all over again. You know, a well-solicited gift is, or a well-stewarded gift is your next major gift. So I want to talk a little bit about giving in the United States. Um, and this, this always sort of blows people's mind. So in 2012, we as Americans gave away $316.23 billion. That's a lot of money. And that actually is up from 2011. And the 2013 numbers will come out probably in March, and we already know that they're up about 5 or 6 percent. We live in a very, very generous country. Um, what's so fascinating is that the biggest chunk that gets um, our contributed revenue is religion. $101 million goes to religion. Education, human services, if you look down to the lower left, you see gifts to foundations. That gifts to foundations are people like, let's just use him as an example, Bill Gates giving his money to the Gates Foundation. So he has made a charitable gift to his foundation, um, but then he gets to give away that money again. So that's sort of like him not getting double dipping, but um, it's like money coming from individuals. Um, Health care, public benefit, the smallest chunk of that money, um, one of the smallest chunk, chunks is to arts and culture and humanities. Um, but look at this. Where is the money coming from? 316.23 billion, $228 billion came from individuals. $228 billion. So when you're sitting in a room with a, I know a lot of you are trustees in this room, when somebody says, we have to go after the corporations, say, no, we don't. $18 billion came from corporations. $228 billion came from individuals. When they say, we need to hire more people to focus on corporate giving, no, you don't. Here's the other fantastic thing, is that when you look at this individual circle, that foundation's 45.74 million. Remember the slide back here where I said that people are giving gifts to foundations? That's individual gifts right there. So this is actually more like, let's call it 80% of gifts are coming from individuals. 80% of gifts. So the point being here is focus on your individuals. Do not... Yes, sir. Can we go back to the last slide? You bet. Religion. The yes. The recipient organization. The religion, those churches? Churches. Those are churches? Okay. Those are churches. All right. Yep. Those are not um, religion-based colleges. That's, that would fall under education. Gotcha. That is churches. Right. Yeah. Um, Look at total giving in the United States from 1972 to 2012. Um, that orange line, I think it's orange, I'm colorblind, um, that runs through um, is current dollars. Um, you can see after 2007 uh, with the Great Recession, there was a dip, but it wasn't that big. Um, and giving is, uh, continues to be on the rise in this country. Um, this is also fascinating to me. Individual giving as a percentage of disposable personal income. Disposable personal income. 
This is after you've paid all your bills. Um, pardon me? There's, these are big numbers. Okay, so let's take a look at what we call our gift grids. Looking across the top, um, a small gift. Um, somebody buys a membership to a museum, somebody uh, um, makes a small annual fund gift. Um, what's the source of that gift? And we call that um, current income. They're, they're writing that gift out of their checking account or they're putting it on their credit card or something like that. Those are generally between $25 and $1,000 if they're unrestricted and restricted gifts between about $1,000 and $5,000. A major gift um, can be income, it can be current income depending on your um, particular circumstance, but it can also be accumulated assets. It can be appreciated stock, it can be um, uh, something that is not necessarily ordinary income. Those tend to be between $1,000 and $50,000 and restricted between $25,000 and a million dollars. And then the mega gifts, the, the huge gifts that you're, you're seeing to some of these campaigns are generally um, given out of assets. And those assets can be estates, they can be um, trusts, um, they can be real estate, they can be all kinds of assets that um, are not ordinary income. And those generally tend to be in the million dollars or more. <clears throat> Um, so those small gifts, uh, we're generally finding those in in-house files, you know, in your membership lists, lists in your annual fund um, donor lists. Um, the involvement of those people is fairly minimal. The solicitation method is mail or phone or an event or, you know, at the front desk. The solicitation relationship is impersonal. Uh, they get solicited every year or twice a year and it's driven, this is a museum instance, but it's driven by the museum. A major gift is a past donor, you know, somebody who's already made a gift to the institution or what we call a suspect. Like we think they have the money to make a major gift. Their involvement is establishing a relationship. The solicitation is absolutely face to face. Who makes the solicitation? A peer, the president, the executive director, the development director, a board member or volunteer. How often? Every three to five years. And it's again driven by the museum and sometimes driven by the donor. And the mega gifts, again, they're past donors, they're life events. Somebody has died and left um, uh, a bequest in their will for the um, institution. It's an inheritance. Somebody has inherited a lot of money and, and needs to defray their um, tax bill. It's the sale of stock. These are people who are very close to the institution. These are the inside family, um, generally. Um, the solicitation is very personal. It involves, it involves a lot of stewardship and it's very, very um, upfront. And generally the solicitation is the donor who, um, one who the donor trusts, admires, and believes in. Oftentimes it's the CEO, oftentimes it's the chairman of the board. How often is that gift gonna happen? Maybe once, maybe more, but often once. Um, so, and it's sometimes driven by the donor's, donor's desire for change or payback or recognition. So, wrapping up, the three secrets of fundraising success. A compelling case for support, I've said that over and over and over again. A written strategy and plan. <clears throat> Very strong leadership equals big gifts. But never forget, maximize the value of volunteers and institutional leadership, the president, the CEO, the senior staff. Create structure, process, and accountability. I can't emphasize that enough, accountability. Keep things moving forward even when you plateau. And here are some of the 10 common pitfalls. Going public prematurely. So many people want to say, we have a $50 million campaign and we have our $10 million donor and let's go to the press. Why would you go to the press? Let's keep that as quiet as possible for as long as possible because as you're then soliciting gifts and soliciting gifts, those people are gonna feel like they're on the inside. They're, and the other thing is, is if someone sees it in the press that you have a $50 million campaign and you have a $10 million donor, well, why do you need my money? So going to the, we, we like to keep things quiet as long as we possibly can. We'll keep things quiet until we get down to that $25,000 level. Um, another pitfall, lack of clear leadership. There needs to be very clear to leadership from the staff to the board um, all down the line. Um, 
Lack of CEO involvement. The CEO is key to involvement, to um, being involved in the campaign. A staff person, a development director, whatnot, cannot drive a campaign. That has to be driven by the CEO. Lack of structure, too few committee meetings, no accountability. Letting ego or internal needs drive goal setting. Campaigns are about institutions, they're not about people. So if we're gonna build a campaign about, around a person, that's very dangerous. It's about the institution, it's about the longevity of institution. One pitfall, not asking for a specific amount. You go in and you ask someone for money and they say, well, how much would you like? Well, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Um, it's happened, truly, it's happened. Or asking for too much or asking for too little. Now, I disagree with this point a little bit because I actually don't think you can ask for too much. No one's gonna be offended if you ask them for too much money. No one is going to be offended if you ask them for too much money. Asking for too little can be a little bit of a problem, not because they're gonna be offended, but you're gonna get too little money. Um, not asking in person, face-to-face -face solicitation is key. Um, getting stalled, losing focus, um, again, that goes back to the lack of structure. Too much dependence on one angel donor that's driving the whole process. Um, and lack of intention fundraising, lack of follow through to close gifts and confirm pledges. Again, this goes back to accountability. So, wrapping up the, com the campaign. It's important to officially end the campaign. Hold a victory celebration for all the volunteers and celebrate them. Um, have a celebration for all the staff, all the staff, janitors, you know, everybody who works down the line, celebrate what they did to make this campaign a success. Write the donors and tell them that you made it. Don't forget about the donors who gave five years ago. Write them and thank them and said, guess what? We just did this. Seek ways to keep volunteers and donors involved to pass the campaign. Honor your recognition commitments in appropriate, creative, and sincere ways. Now, before I get to questions, I'm gonna tell you a funny story. <clears throat> At the Houston Museum of Fine Arts, we built a new building Huge new building. And you know, they like things big in Texas, really big in Texas. And we had a donor wall that's about three times as high as this wall and about this wide. And we were gonna put every donor of $100,000 and above etched onto this wall, like in Rome, you know, like etched onto this wall. And we had an artist do a rendering of what everybody's names would look like. And the largest donors had bigger type and then it got smaller and whatnot. And then the director of the museum, who was a brilliant fundraiser, took that at sketch and he sent it to every single donor who was gonna be on the wall. And he said, this is what it's gonna look like when it's etched. Five more million dollars were raised. Well, I don't want my name down there. I want my name up there. I want my name here. I want my name here. <laughs> so recognition is very, very important. So questions? Yes, sir. I find it um, somewhat contradictory, but very curious, because you started out by saying that at the beginning of a capital campaign, you need to have your top 10. You need to know, going into the campaign, who your top 10 donors mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. That chart that you showed up there, the, uh, I forget what you call Range it. Range of Gifts table? Range of, yeah, uh -huh. Range of Gifts table. Had, I, I noted, nine different well, levels on yep. there. Yep. And if you, if you knew who your top 10 donors were and how much you could expect from them, mm -hmm. it's almost like you don't need to do the campaign. Not true. Well, I know it's not true right. because because your top ten donors are not going to, your top ten donors are not going to get you to your goal. Your top ten donors are going to get you off the ground. See what I'm saying? Well, I, I know that's the reality. Right. That's not what I heard you say. Though. Okay. <laughs> I know that's the reality because we've been at this with the museum for fifteen years now, right. fourteen years. Right. And. Identify, it's one thing to identify who you think your top 10 donors are. Right. It's, a, it's another matter entirely to get them to commit to, to a donation. Absolutely. And 
And I think that's the, that's the huge problem. We've had any number of people tell us, including corporations, you've got a great project. This is the Marine Museum? Yeah. yeah. You've got a great project. We think this is very worthy. And you know, here's $10,000 now, and we'll be there for you when you break ground and start you know, building. Well, the problem is, you got a lot of guys saying that. Yeah. You can't ever get to breaking ground if everybody is saying that. How do you right. overcome that? Well, that goes back to my point about sequential fundraising, is that, because um, I think we've come into this project more recently, right? In, you with you guys? Yeah. yeah. So um, by focusing on the top of your pyramid and not focusing on sort of that 10,000, you know, sort of, I'm not going to use the word wallowing necessarily, but sort of mucking around a little bit in that $10,000 pool is discouraging because you think, well, how the hell am I ever going to get this thing out of the ground? You know, because I don't have, we don't have the momentum of that top of the pyramid, you know, driving us and, and having other people follow by example. So that's, that's the notion of sequential fundraising and that it's, it's so important to focus on the top of that pyramid first. Does that answer your question? Well, it, yeah, I mean, I understand the theory behind it. Right. <laughs> and I think it's, it's great. The, so, the, the actual making it happen, though, is a I realize that difficult it, proposition. And I often say that there's an art to fundraising and a science to fundraising. That range of gifts table and all of that sort of math and all of that is the science of fundraising. The art of fundraising is the cultivation process, is the case, is the, is the engagement, is, is all of that. So it's, it's combining that sort of art and science of, of fundraising. I have something to ask you after we've concluded it's a supposed campaign plan that I'd like you to look at. Sure. I was struck by the graph that you put up that showed the uh, 238 billion came from uh, individuals. Billion. Uh, first of all, was that a nationwide yes. number? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I struck for several reasons, in fact, Grant and I were talking about this before, it was back in the museum, uh, <clears throat> to ratchet it down to where we are. Yep. Uh, a relatively small area. Mm -hmm. uh, people who get hit constantly with this fundraiser, that fundraiser, right. they're not necessarily not the profits. That's what they're not. Plus all of the other issues, that various non for profits competing for resources, uh, not just outside grants, but within our community from the right. standpoint of going to the individual. What happens is, I mean, I have many business people tell me, you know, <coughs> we're worn out. Everybody comes by to see us, you know, and, and, and we just uh, don't have the resources to, to do this much in, in a relatively uh, small area like we're dealing with here. Right. Uh, so, you know, I was struck with a uh, chance looking at the museum that it would be really uh, good if they could get a, a major uh, benefactor to help them because they've been at it, as Bruce said, for 15 years. And we've all given money to it, but it's not anywhere near enough, and I'm not convinced that we're going to get near enough to do what needs to be done from individual donations mm -hmm. in this area. Now, you know, if you're looking at a, a campaign that's all across, uh, you know, New York City or, or, or the whole state of New York or something like that, or North Carolina, it's a different ball game in my mind uh, than what we're faced with. Right. I mean, I, I think you're in a unique situation, and I said this earlier. And that the Museum of the Marine is not, at least as I understand it, a regional museum, but it is a national museum. It is a, right? It's a national museum. It's a museum dedicated to the Marine. Well, it's not a museum dedicated to the Marines of the Carolinas yeah. and the communities I see. that support. Okay. It's not like the Marine Corps Museum. Is Got it. Got it. Yeah, I mean... United Way campaign. I mean, Paul, pick yep. another yep. I, I add a little bit. We are going outside of this county, and we're making great strides to do that. And within uh, probably two weeks, we'll have our campaign uh, uh, case for support up here, 1,000 copies of it. And we will then launch 
way outside of here, and um, I would would only welcome you to wait a year, and then we'll have a different perspective. Well, it may be misunderstood where I'm going. Though. No, I understand what you're going on. There's repetitive this year of asking our same the idea of yeah, but we we've, bro we've broken that bolt. I think we're just in the verge of. But I think okay, I, there's any number of examples. The museum's only one in our community. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just one of many, many, so that's really well. Now, are you both on the same project? No. We are. No, I'm, no I am. On, on I'm the United Way board member. Oh, okay. I was, I was, I was, I was, I was thinking it's more of a communication problem here than anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm afraid uh, we're going to have to break at this point, but thank you very much for your attention, and I really enjoyed being here.